Well, good morning. Um, I bring greetings from Mike Sherrod, Pastor Mike. Uh, many of you know he, uh, his daughter got married yesterday, so, um, and he, uh, he wasn't doing the ceremony, but he had to give the pronouncement, and this whole week he had been practicing it with me in the office because, and I asked him, so Mike, how many of these have you done? He's like in the hundreds, and, but when it's your own daughter, it's a little different. <laughs> uh, so he was doing that today, but he, he brings greetings, and he'll be back next week to continue uh, the study in First Thessalonians. Um, but for us this morning, uh, we are continuing our study in the book of Acts. In our study, the account of the history of the early church. Last week, we considered opposition from outside of the church, even to the extent of outright hostility to the point of arrests and interrogations and beatings, and even almost death to the leaders of the church because they refused to stop preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. Today we have for us an account of conflict within the church. This is not the first time we've seen trouble within the church. At the beginning of chapter 5, we have the case of Ananias and Sapphira. We saw what sin can do. Once again, I think it's really important to note that the author, Luke, is not out to paint a rosy picture of the church. The church he is describing is not a perfect church because it doesn't exist. Even these 12 apostles are not heroes. If you put it in those terms, there is one hero in the story. Only one hero in the entire history of the world. The Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 6 from verse 1 through verse 7. And I ask the congregation to please rise for the reading of God's word. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Thus ends the reading of God's holy, infallible, and inerrant word. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. You know, pretty often when we watch movies, there comes a time when the screen kind of goes dark on us all of a sudden, and then suddenly the screen comes back, and on the bottom of the screen or in the middle of the screen, you, you see, you know, 10 years later or 20 years later, five years later, skips forward in time. And so where we left off at the end of chapter 5 last week, we saw the arrest, the questioning, the beating, and, and the, 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 the eventual releasing, the warning given to the disciples. You stop preaching that Jesus is the Christ. And the apostles disobeyed that order. They continued, the last verse of chapter 5, they continued to preach and teach the word of God every day in the temple from house to house. They did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And chapter 6 is like that flash forward. It's 
about three years later. It's a new episode in the life of the early church. Verse 1 is the first time we come across the word disciple in the entire book of Acts. Jesus, toward the end of his time on earth, told his disciples to go and make disciples in what we call the Great Commission. A disciple is a follower, someone who directs his mind to something. It says that they were increasing in numbers. And among the followers, among the disciples, were the Hellenists. We haven't seen that word yet either. These are Greek-speaking Jews who are disciples. And there's a complaint among them. What do we as a society generally think about complainers? Here we have a complaint. How are we as Christians called to handle complaints? I recently came across an article in Christianity Today. It was obviously written with church leaders in mind. However, it's really directed for everyone in the church. The title of the article is 10 Ways to Deal with Chronic Complainers in the Church. Do complainers present potential problems within the church? Yeah. Can complainers create division among the congregation? Potentially. So what are the 10 ways to deal with chronic complainers in the church? You know what number one is? Don't assume that every complaint is wrong. That's wise. Number two on the list, check your attitude when listening to them. They may have a very valid complaint. Whether we find ourselves as being the recipient of a complaint or the giver of a complaint, I'm reminded what one of the Puritans said, the best protection one can have from the devil and his schemes is a humble heart. And that's what we see here. Widows are being neglect, neglected. It's a complaint that needs to be heard. It seems like we don't hear enough about the care of widows and orphans in the church today. Yet, it's all over scripture. The care for widows and widowers figures prominently in God's agenda for the church. We see it here. We see it in the Apostle Paul's writings to Timothy. We see it alluded to in James. We see it all over the Psalms. In the Old Testament law, provisions were very specific for the care of widows. God describes himself as a father to the fatherless and a defender to the widows, Psalm 146. Most of all, we see it in the actions and in the preaching of the Lord Jesus himself. One of his last acts, while he's hanging on the cross, is the provision for his mother. There was the Apostle John, one of his disciples, standing there. Jesus looks at his mother and says, Woman, behold your son. To the, to the apostle, he says, Son, behold your mother. We are told in marriage that two become one flesh. And so the pain of widowhood 
brings a unique dimension to loneliness. It's jarring to suddenly be alone when one has been accustomed to constant companionship with one's spouse over a long period of time. And it's not just losing your spouse and the pain of that. Oftentimes, one loses their community too. Oftentimes, the relationships you had with other couples doesn't withstand the loss of a spouse. It's a valid complaint. And the apostles, they respond accordingly. The response is one which provides a blueprint for us, for us today, on how we prioritize and see how God raises up leaders in the church. The apostles summon all the disciples. They tell them to pick out seven men. Now Luke doesn't give us all the details of why the widows of the Hellenists were being neglected. Could it have something to do with the fact that they were Hellenists, Greek-speaking Jews? Could it be a, a, a language barrier that was there? Could it be cultural differences that made it harder to care for? It's all possible, but Luke doesn't give us the reason. Notice that, yes, the seven names are Greek names. So it's probable. But notice the apostles are not primarily concerned with that. What the apostles are primarily concerned with is the character of these men. They didn't say, find seven Greeks. Did not say, find the wealthier among you. They didn't say, find those that have the most, most time in their hands. They said, find seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom. Does that mean that these seven were the only ones doing the work? Remember, at this point in the church, there are thousands Seven? No. There's no way that seven people could be able to keep up with this. This past year, especially, there has been a number of times when I call somebody that I haven't seen or spoken to in a while. And it usually starts off like this. I'm so sorry, I haven't reached out to you. I haven't called you more often. And more often than not, I usually get the response, no worries. Not you, but people in the church have been keeping up with me. The person came by and prayed with me. This person brought me a meal. I personally cannot express how much that encourages me in our church. What it says to me is that Calvary, we're doing ministry <laughs> according to the blueprint laid out. What we read about serve tables in the verse 2 is the Greek word diakonos. It's where we get the word for deacon. One thing I love most about Calvary is the work that happens. Not just the deacons and the deaconesses work, but a lot of people's diaconal work being done within the congregation. Most of it gets done behind the scenes. We don't all see them. Sometimes I, don't, I know I don't see them. Countless hours worked, countless miles driven, countless meals delivered, people going out of their own pocket for things over and above their regular giving. 
not trying to earn anything. Again, a lot of it's done behind the scenes. The blueprint is people of good repute. In other words, trusted by the community. Full of the spirit. They're not trying to earn anything. There is a spiritual dimension to the physical work. Or as the Apostle Paul says, it is God who works in you, both to will and to work his good pleasure. There is wisdom needed as well. Sometimes what may seem like helping somebody is actually hurting that person. If I were to try to summarize it, what the church needs are leaders with godly character before anything else. And so, yes, it's really important that we take care of widows. Really important. It's really important that we take care of the poor. We care for the sick, for the needy. It's really important that we have leaders with godly character of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom. These are very important things. However, they are not the most important aspect of, of the ministry of the church. The most important aspect of the ministry of the church, what should be of First priority when it comes to the work of the church is the advancing of the word of God. What we see emphasized here by Luke and the apostles more than anything else in this passage is the primacy and the priority of the word. The main idea is, yes, we need to care for widows. We need to be organized. We need to make sure the leaders of the church are of good character. However, the ministry of the word comes first. Three times in seven verses, the primacy of the, and the priority of the word of God is displayed. Verse two, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Verse 4, the apostles are saying, yes, we need to do this, but we need to devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And it's not like some kind of oligarchy. It may read like that to some, where the apostles are uh, out for their own stature, their own hierarchy. Look at verse 7. Look how Luke, Luke puts it. It's the word of God that increased, not the apostles. Many translations make it a little easier for us to understand. The word of God kept spreading, like spreading seed. The Lord Jesus uses that metaphor in Matthew 13 of a sower who scatters seed. The Apostle Paul talks about his work as one who plants other people preaching and teaching may even water the plant, but it is God who creates the growth. Whatever God is doing in the world in a saving and redemptive way is only when his word is moving forward. No one can be saved without hearing his word. It is the gospel that is the power of God. Romans 1. Faith comes through hearing, Romans 10. Wherever the kingdom of God is advancing, it is because his word is advancing. No revival can happen apart from his word. Look what verse 7 says. The word of God increased, directly related to that, the number of disciples multiplied greatly. Without the word of God, there are no disciples. From the beginning, 
even from creation. How is it that God created the world? He spoke it to being. Let there be. The Apostle John writes in the Gospel according to John, In the beginning there was the Word. That Word is Jesus. In Jesus we have God's revelation. He reveals himself to us in Jesus. And we also have redemption. In his word, we have revelation about God. And we also, by hearing, have redemption. The biggest priority in the church is that the word of God advances because all the ministries of the church are dependent upon the word of God advancing or spreading. This is not only the case for the church, this is also the case for the individual Christian. Study after study. Do you want to guess what the biggest catalyst is in the maturing of an individual Christian? Is it service? Is it fellowship with other people? Is it church attendance? By far, it's the studying and meditating upon the Word of God. So the question is, what is it that keeps the church from spreading the word of God? What is it that keeps it from advancing God's holy word? Two ideas. First is doubting the power of the word. I read to you from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the, sow to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word. Doubting God's word is the same as doubting God. The contrast to that, trusting God's word is the same as trusting God. Second, there is a tendency to treat God's word as advice and not good news. I was recently listening to someone comparing Christianity with every religion on earth. Every other religion is advice. Christianity is good news. Advice is counsel to help you get something accomplished. Good news is telling you it was already accomplished for you. There is a tendency, even within the church, to receive the gospel as if it's advice. It's not. Some say, give your heart to Christ. When in fact, Christ is the donor 
who gave himself to you, for you. Some say, get on fire for the Lord. Scripture says, you have been made the light of the world. Some say, get hungry for God. The word of God says, take, eat, receive. Some say, give your life to God. <laughs> Scripture says, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Then at the end of verse 7, we read of a great many priests becoming obedient to the faith. Seems random, doesn't it? However, at this time, there were thousands of priests in Jerusalem. They would be the primary administrators of mercy ministry within the Jewish religious system. Not going to work. These priests would know something about having compassion about people. And when they understood the compassion that Jesus has for his people, of course, they too numbered among the covenant community. You join me in a word of prayer. Most holy God, we come before you, creatures of the dust. We thank you for the ways in which you have revealed yourself to us. We thank you for taking upon yourself flesh, revealing yourself in the person and the work of Jesus. We thank you that you called him to live the life that we are not capable of living. And then in our place, causing us to be hidden in him and his righteousness. Lord, we thank you for your word. Grant us a hunger for your word, not out of earning it or earning favor in your sight, but of acknowledging your goodness to us. giving you back the life <laughs> that you've purchased with the great price paid. May the word of God advance at Calvary in this region. All for your sake. For the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen.